the ETCS, uh, the title of the stock is uh, large sets. As always, if at any point anyone wishes to ask a question or make a comment, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, you can also ask questions in the chat. And in that case, I can interrupt Tom for you. Uh, we will also be having question. We will also be having a questions round at the end of the talk. And uh, if anyone is more comfortable asking questions in Spanish, you can do that, and I can always translate. Um, well, yeah. Thank you very much, Tom. Please take it away. Okay. Thank you very much, Juan and Carlos, for organizing, and thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, now that Bob's pointed out, I should I should say something about that scary number 145 at the bottom of my slide. So I put in many pauses in my Beamer talk, so, so, so don't be scared, we'll race through them. Um, so uh, yes, I'm, as, as Juan said, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, large sets, or another way to put it would be large cardinals in, um, in categorical set theory. So um, actually, my primary interest here is not actually in, in large cardinals. What it's really about is the is different ways of thinking about sets. So here's a hypothesis. So I don't claim it's true, but it's a hypothesis, which is that everything in traditional set theory based on the membership relation, so everything there that is relevant to the rest of mathematics can be done uh, smoothly, equally smoothly in categorical set theory. So one can never know that this hypothesis is true. It's unprovable because it could always be that just over the horizon, there's some part of, of set theory that works wonderfully in ZFC and is important to mathematics, but doesn't work wonderfully in categorical set theory. But at least, you know, we can have a look. And so we're going to spend uh, an hour or so having a look. And we're going to do this by looking at how large cardinals, or at least the very, very beginning of the theory of large cardinals, looking at how that functions in one particular version of categorical set theory, um, which is Blauvier's elementary theory of the category of sets from 1964. Okay, um, so the, the plan is, is very simple. First of all, I'm going to introduce uh, the elementary theory of the category of sets, and then I'm gonna talk about how large sets look in ETCS. So, um, uh, here are just um, a few references. There's Lorbeer's original paper from 50 years ago. Uh, Lorbeer, together with Bob Roseborough, wrote this book called uh, Sets for Mathematics, um, based on that theory, but expanding on it. And I wrote a short paper um, summarizing the axioms and trying to put them in a very elementary way um, a bit more recently. Okay, so let me say it as fast as possible and then spend a long time uh, saying it more slowly. So in one sentence, the elementary theory of the category of sets is that sets and functions form a well-pointed topos with natural numbers and cho choice. So if you know what that means, then great. Um, if you don't know what that means, I'm going to explain anyway. This is a, obviously, it's a very jargon-laden way of saying it. It's, it's using lots of of terminology. And it hides a really, really crucial point, which is that ETCS does not require the general notion of category. So it looks like even stating ETCS requires these very sophisticated concepts of um, you know, topos and well-pointedness and so on. Um, however, it is a complete, it's just as elementary as say ZFC, even though that sentence doesn't make it look like it. And it's just like if you want to study um, the integers, if you want to do number theory, then you know number theory uses vastly sophisticated technology and you know, talks in terms of all sorts of scheme theoretic things. Um, but you know, if you want to discuss addition and multiplication of integers, you can do that without even knowing what a ring is. So in just the same way, if you want to discuss how sets and functions behave, you don't need the general notion of category. And, uh, and I'll demonstrate that. Um, before I get to that, I want to talk a bit about um, ZFC um, as well as ETCS. So people really like debating set theory in a way that no one ever debates, say, ring theory. And partly people, what people debate is which version of set theory models best what mathematicians actually do. 
and um, and so I don't want to do any of that debate today. So that, that the little paper of mine I referred to kind of gets into that argument, but I, I don't want to talk about that today. However, I think it's clarifying, um, especially for people from certain parts of mathematics, if I do compare a little bit the the um, the differences between um, ZFC uh, and and this categorical set theory UTCS. So here's a little table. First of all. In ZFC, the elements of a set are always sets. In ETCS, the elements of a set are a different kind of thing from sets. In ZFC, membership is a global relationship. So given two sets, you can always ask whether the first one is an element of the second. And in ETCS, that question makes no sense. Um, for related reasons, in ZSC, if you're given two abstract sets, X and Y, you can always form their intersection. And in ETCS, you never can. If, if X and Y are presented as subsets of some other, some third set, then sure, you certainly can intersect them. But if they're just abstract sets, then, um, then you can't. ZSC is very much not isomorphism invariant. So for example, I'll, I'll talk in a moment about um, uh, cardinals and ordinals. So, you know, every set is in bijection with a cardinal. Every set's isomorphic to a cardinal, but not every set is a cardinal in ZFC. But in ETCS, absolutely everything is isomorphism invariant, and that um, is is you know is, is probably the strongest selling point that in in most of modern mathematics we do everything up to isomorphism. You know, you don't care what the elements of a group actually are; you only care what the group is up to isomorphism. Okay, so those are some of the differences. Now, um, uh, I want to talk about the, the, the starting point. So the starting point for ZFC is you say, there are some things called sets and there's a relation on, on set called membership. Um, so the primitive things, the primitive ingredients of ZFC are sets and the element relation. The notion of function is derived from those as is the notion of composition of functions. In ETCS, Sets are still a primitive notion, but membership is something uh, that you derive. The other primitive notions in ETCS are functions and composition. So while ZFC is a theory of sets and membership, ETCS is a theory of sets, functions, and their composition. OK, so those are some of the differences. Um, I'll illustrate that by talking about something quite relevant, which is um, cardinals and ordinals. So in, in ZFC or, or um, many of its cousins, um, there's a very, very clever definition of an ordinal as a set with certain properties. Those properties crucially use the fact that um, elements of sets are also sets. And, um, and you can show that every well-ordered set is isomorphic as an ordered set to exactly one ordinal. That's a, that's a theorem. And then similarly, a cardinal is defined as an ordinal with certain properties. And then it's a theorem that every set is isomorphic to a unique cardinal. And so um, you know, there, is a, there is a difference between ordinals and well-ordered sets. And, um, and it's a difference that matters. However, in categorical set theory, such as ETCS, the whole point is that everything should be isomorphism invariant. So um, there's really no need to talk about ordinals. It doesn't make sense. You just talk about well-ordered sets. And similarly, there's no need to ever use the noun cardinal. You just talk about sets. So in just the same way, you know, group theorists don't have a special word for an isomorphism class of groups. They just talk about groups. And sometimes the word group means an isomorphism class of groups. Like when you say there are two groups of order four, that means there are two isomorphism group classes of groups of order four, but you don't need a special word for isomorphism class of groups. And you know, in the same way, in categorical set theory, the the nouns ordinal and cardinal aren't aren't really useful. So you know, we, we don't there's no need to talk about cardinals. So I'm just I'm not going to talk about large cardinals or inaccessible cardinals. I'll talk about large sets and inaccessible sets and so on. Okay, so. Um, what does ETCS actually say without um, using lots of topos theoretic terminology? Well, 
Um, as I indicated a moment ago, the starting point is some things called sets, just like ZFC. But instead of having a membership relation, we also um, take as primitive data the functions with specified domain and codomain and the operation of composition. Okay, so that is the data to which uh, the axioms will apply. And I'm going to give the axioms now. Now, um, because this talk has other ambitions, I'm not going to attempt to, um, uh, to talk in detail about the axioms, but I want to say a little bit about each of them. So um, they're stated in, in all three of the references that I gave at the start of this section. Okay, so um, in one line each, the axioms go like this. So first of all, um, we've got a category. Okay, there are gonna be 10 axioms and the other nine will say what special things there are about this category as opposed to other categories. The second axiom says, well, informally there's a set with one element. Um, formally, um, there exists a terminal set, of course, that universal property determines up to isomorphism and I'll just call it one. Okay, so this is a category theory seminar. I'm not, I'm not gonna go through the, um, the standard categorical um, concepts here, um, but this is what allows us to define elementhood membership. So an element of a set is by definition, a function from one into that set. Uh, so that's the definition of element. That's how we derive the concept of element. Um, there's a set with no elements, fine. And then a crucial axiom is that a function is determined by what it does to elements. So if you have two functions with the same domain and codomain and they do the same things to all elements, then they're equal. Where I've written fx here, you can interpret this as, well, it is the composite of f with x, which after all is a function, but you could also put brackets around the x. Right, so, so composition and evaluation are the same thing. Uh, we've got products, we've got exponentials, we've got, um, well, this is a special case of pullbacks. And then the eighth axiom says, okay, so in order to put it into one line, I've said the subsets of a set X correspond to the functions from X to zero, one. Actually, what the axiom says is something a bit weaker, which is there is some set omega such that the injections into X correspond to the functions from X to omega. And then the rest of the axioms imply that omega has exactly two elements. Um, and then you say um, categorically the natural numbers form a set and this last one is the axiom of choice. Okay, so that's a, a slightly informal, but not terribly informal um, uh, list of the axioms. So these are all everyday mathematical statements. Right. Um, so I just want to add one thing to, one more thing about ETCS before we get into the stuff about large sets, which is how you handle families of sets because this is a bit different in categorical set theory to um, something like ZFC. So let's say we take a set I and we want to consider families of sets indexed by I. So what it is, is a, um, a function into I and you think of the fibers as the members of the family, right? So we have X sitting up here and I down there, and the fiber over an element of I is, is, um, is, is thought of as the ith member of the family. And so it's a, it's a feature um, of ETCS that, um, that you can't talk about the family, you can't talk about a family of sets without already having its coproduct, right? So this, this set X here is the coproduct of the XIs. Um, and that's, uh, that's just how it is. Um, okay, so here's a de uh, another definition. So I'll write less than or equal to um, to mean the existence of an injection. So I guess normally we'd put 
bars around the A's and the A and the B, but there's no particular reason to. Um, and then it's a theorem that if you have any non-empty family of sets, there is some member that is least, right? So if you like, there's a member of least cardinality. So roughly speaking, that's saying that sets are well ordered by this um, cardinal inequality here. And this is a very important property because it means, for example, you know, if I if I define some property of sets, like you know, I talk about the enormous, I define what it means for a set to be enormous, then as long as there's at least one enormous set, I can talk about the least enormous set. And I'll do that kind of thing. All right. So that's the end of the um, little introduction to ETCS. So I guess um, seeing as it's in the spirit of things to ask questions during the talk, now is a now's a good time if there are questions that have accumulated so far. Uh, well, if no one else has a question, I do have one uh, mm -hmm. quick question. So what happens with the actions of, actions of ETCS if you, instead of um, asking for the empty set to not have elements be um, an initial object? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, things are quite delicate. If I just change axiom three to say there's an initial set, then there would be a trivial model of this. Okay. where there's just one set and the identity on it. Um, this, if you look at axioms two and three together, it's clear that there must be at least two sets, right, two yeah. non-isomorphic sets. And so this, uh, the only, the only um, role of axiom three here is to, is to forbid the trivial model. Okay, okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of little ways you can change um, the axioms and you know for example when Lorvier first came up with this he he didn't realize that uh, um, the, well he, he included co-products as one axiom um, mm -hmm. and then um, it was Bob Perret right who, who proved that was unnecessary is that right Bob was that you yes <laughs> great fantastic um, I, I was looking for the mute button <laughs> <laughs> great didn't um, yeah. Chris Mickelson get there first? Sorry, what? Didn't Chris Mickelson get there before you, Bob? Uh, yes, he did. <laughs> ah. By the way, I've just established contact with him. Uh -huh. Oh. Okay. Um, I have a small question. Like, uh, please. Can, uh, the 10 action, what's... What do you get from the 10 uh, axiom in ETCS? I don't see that very clearly. Uh, sorry, can you ask, can you say that again? Um, uh, I cannot see very clearly why the every rejection has, like, why stated like that? Um, I mean, this, this, are you asking why this is equivalent to being a well-pointed topos with natural numbers objects in choice? Well, I, I didn't know about that, but uh, uh, like, I mean, I'm taking I'm taking this list as for this talk. I'm taking this as the definition of ETCS. Okay. Um, um, I'm sorry if I can maybe interpret what Luis is asking. Uh, maybe what I understood was that he was asking about axiom ten. Yeah. Uh, why? I, I suppose what's the intuition behind it? Behind like uh, like that, I guess. Huh, because like in stating this, like uh, uh, that, it has to have a right inverse, or that it has like uh, this property of uh, if like it can it be stated like having like a a cancellation rule, like if two things are equal using the function, then you can kind of cancel out or. Um, I mean, this is, I don't know if it can be stated as a cancellation rule. This is uh, the axiom of choice, right? So so to say, when you have a surjection, that means Sorry. every, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, I forgot that it's equivalent to the axiom of choice. Sorry. Ah, right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I should have. I kind of want to draw a picture, but I'm not set up to do that. So, yeah. yeah so, to, to sorry, the sorry. Yeah, it's because... yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forgot okay. about that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, so let's go to large sets. So there are a whole bunch of um, of of like very very well explored conditions on large cardinals and. Um, and the ones that I'm going to mention are these, or maybe not all of these, depending on how time goes. Um, and so, you know, any set theorist would look at this and see two things. One is that there are, um, uh, well, maybe they see lots of things. One is that there, are, there aren't many conditions here. Another is they don't go very, very high. So, um, so you know, measurable sets are not that large as in, in the world of large cardinals. Um, and another thing is that, Many of these around the bottom of the diagram are already guaranteed by ZFC. So the point is that ETCS is a weaker theory than ZFC. So what counts as a large set in ETCS? Um, it, I mean, when I say large, I mean not a set whose existence is not guaranteed by the axioms. What counts as large in ETCS doesn't count as large in ZFC. So for example, here his Beth fixed points, whatever they are. So the existence of Beth fixed points is guaranteed by ZFC, but it's not guaranteed by ETCS. Um, so that's something that uh, that happens. Um, okay. Anyway, let's get going. So the first the first um, type of large set I want to talk about are the are the strong limits, and the definition is is this: it's uh, an infinite set X is said to be strong if the collection of sets smaller than it is closed under taking power sets. And that's, um, that's just a definition. It's one of these definitions that you think, well, you know, why is that interesting? Um, well, okay, so for example, you can see that n is a strong limit because if you know, the power set of a finite set is finite. Um, so to me, the reason why this, this definition is interesting is this theorem that the uncountable strong limits are exactly the ones that um, kind of can't be reached using ETCS. So ETCS provides certain specific sets such as the natural numbers and certain ways of building new sets out of old like products and exponentials and so on. And um, for X to be an uncountable strong limit means that you, you kind of, you can't get to X using um, what ETCS, ETCS provides. Um, and so here's a, um, a corollary of this theorem that uh, it's consistent with ETCS that there are no uncountable strong limits. In other words, if ETCS is consistent, then it's consistent, um, uh, then ETC, ETCS together with the existence of, uh, let me say this again, if there's a model of ETCS, then there is a model in which there are no uncountable strong limits. Okay, so in this talk, there are going to be lots of pairs of theorems and corollaries, roughly like this. And so I'll prove this corollary from the theorem, and then that'll be the one and only time that I do a proof of a corollary. So it's, it's very simple, it goes like this. So take a model of ETCS, and let's call a set in this model small, if it is smaller than every uncountable strong limit. The theorem then implies that the small sets are a model of ETCS. And by definition, there are no uncountable strong limits in this model. And so we're done. Okay, so, so every time I show you a theorem and a corollary of this kind, that's what the proof of the corollary looks like. Okay, um, so those are strong limits. So the term strong limit tells you there's probably something called a weak limit, and there is. And here's a little um, thought, first of all, that there are two standard ways you can make a set bigger. And one is to take the power set, and the other is to take the smallest set bigger than X, which is called the successor. Okay, and it might be that they're equal, and to say that they're equal or isomorphic is exactly the generalized continuum hypothesis. But there's no guarantee that that's the case. 
And so um, often in set theory, if you see some definition involving um, power sets, then there's a, there's a kind of sister definition involving successors and vice versa. So an infinite set is a weak limit if, um, if this holds. So that's just the same as the definition of strong limit, but with y plus instead of two to the y. Um, and it's quite easy to see that um, it's equivalent to say that x itself is not a successor. Um, and um, we just saw that it's consistent with ETCS that there are no uncountable strong limits. And so um, uh, it follows from the, uh, the consistency of GCH that there are no one, that it's consistent that there are no uncountable weak limits. Okay, so ETCS does not guarantee even the existence of an uncountable weak limit. So, you know, I think many professional set theorists regard ETCS as, as extremely weak. Um, all right. So you can't get very far in set theory without talking about well-ordered sets. And that's what I'm going to do now. Um, uh, so the definition is it's, a, it's an ordered set. It's, a, it's an ordered set where every non-empty subset has a least element. And a crucial fact is that if you take two well-ordered sets, then one of them embeds inside the other as a downwards closed subset. And I'll write a kind of this curly less than or equal to, to mean this. Um, and it's a fact that up to isomorphism, um, this embedding relation is a well order on the class of well ordered sets. So in other words, if you have any family of, of well ordered sets, there's one that is least with respect to this, this curly ordering. Okay, so those are the basic facts. Um, and so here is something that is um, uh, kind of distinctive about categorical set theory. Right. So it's an adjunction. It's going to be an adjunction between sets and well-ordered sets. So first of all, if you start with a well-ordered set, you can throw away the well-ordering and you get an ordinary set. In the other direction, if you start with a set X, you can choose an initial well order on it. So an initial well order means one that is least with respect to this uh, embedding relation. So I'm calling that I of X. Now, if you have a particular set, there are many initial well orders on it, but they're all isomorphic. Um, so, um, so this really is a well-defined thing. And you then get an adjunction. So this adjunction is, you know, this is not the usual category of sets. This is the category of sets with, so this is, an, uh, um, this is an order, right? So it's the category whose objects are sets and where there's at most one map from one set to another. And there is one if and only if this is less than or equal to that. Okay, so these both sides of the adjunction are large orders, they're ordered classes. And this I is left adjoint to U. And moreover, this adjunction has a special property that if you do I and then U, you get back to where you started. Now, every adjunction restricts in a canonical way to an equivalence. You take the fixed points on each side. And when you do that here, um, the equivalence you get is between sets and the initial well-ordered sets. So in other words, the well-orders that are least of their cardinality. And so, and one reason why I mentioned this is that um, I, I mentioned before the very, very clever encoding of, of um, cardinals as special ordinals and ordinals as special sets. Well, the encoding of cardinals as, as ordinals has a kind of echo here. So what, um, ZFC theorists do um, uh, in regarding cardinals as ordinals is, is kind of related to this. Okay, um, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, Alephs and Beths. Now, Alephs and Beths are a basic thing in set theory, but in categorical set theory, or at least in ETCS, they, the natural approach looks a bit different. 
So I'm going to be talk about something that I call the index of a set. I don't know whether it has a standard name. If it does, I'd like to hear it. But it's this. So given an infinite set X, we can talk about the isomorphism classes of infinite sets smaller than it. Okay, and that really is a set because you can construct it like this. And so we order this by cardinal inequality. Okay. So for example, if you take the, the smallest uncountable set, which is called N plus, its index consists of the isomorphism classes of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this example's wrong because I included the finite sets here. I do apologize. So ignore this example. In any case, the index construction gives you a map from sets to well-ordered sets. And it's not too hard to see that it's a, an order embedding. So if, if you have one set that is strictly smaller than another, then um, the index of one embeds strictly into the index of the other. Um, it's also not too hard to see that if um, the index of a set is omega, or in fact, more generally, if the index of a set has no greatest elements, then the set must be a weak limit. And we know that ETCS does not guarantee the existence of any uncountable weak limits. And so in fact, it's consistent with ETCS that there are no sets with index omega. And the reason why I bother mentioning this is that, um, uh, is that it, it tells you in particular that this embedding, you know, it, the image of this embedding really might not be all of the class of well-ordered sets, that there might be well-ordered sets that do not arise as the index of anything at all. Um, sorry, I should have said omega is, um, is the natural numbers regarded as a well-ordered set. It tends to be denoted by omega rather than n when you're thinking of it as a well-ordered set. Okay, so that's how you go from a, that's one way of going from a set to a well-ordered set. So it's different from the initial um, well-order on x. Um, it's a different way of doing it. Um, but this leads into the um, notion of an Aleph. So if you have a well-ordered set that is in the image of this embedding, if it does correspond to some, uh, to some infinite set, then uh, then that set is written as Aleph W, okay? Now, this X is well-defined up to isomorphism because this is an embedding. There can't be two different sets um, that have the same index. Okay, so, so that's what Aleph W means if it exists. So it might not exist if, if W isn't in the image of this embedding. That's, that's the definition. Um, so the, the more kind of classical way of saying it is that um, uh, is this recursive definition that um, Aleph W is the smallest infinite set that is bigger than all the previous Alephs. Um, so for example, Aleph zero is just the smallest infinite set, which is the natural numbers. Um, and we've seen that it's consistent with ETCS that um, uh, Aleph W does not exist. That's the same thing as I said a moment ago, but in different language. Um, here's another way of putting it that I think is quite appealing and has nothing. It's a statement that doesn't mention well orders or any kind of orders at all, which is that all Alephs exist if and only if, whenever you give me a set I, I can give you a family of sets indexed by I that all have different cardinalities. So an I-indexed family of non-isomorphic sets, pairwise non-isomorphic sets. So what that's saying is that there are more sets, and I mean isomorphism classes of sets, than there are elements of any individual sets set. So there are more sets than there are elements of any individual set. Um, so it's, you know, it's a reasonably plausible sounding um, axiom. Okay. Um, those are the Alephs. And what comes after Aleph is Beth. 
And let's come back to this um, kind of competition or sisterhood between um, successors and power sets. So a trivial little observation is that when you take two sets, X and Y, X is less than Y if and only if the successor of X is less than or equal to Y. And once you've seen a successor, you think, ah, what happens if I replace that by a power set? So um, another kind of relationship you can look at is whether two to the X is less than or equal to Y. And so the, the definition of, um, of the Beths, so this is Beth here, um, is exactly the same as the definition of the Alephs, but with this change made. So we say that Beth Omega exists if there's some infinite set, not bigger than Beth V, but bigger than or equal to the power set of Beth V for every V smaller than W. Okay, and, and if such a thing exists, then Beth W is the smallest one. So Beth zero is simply the smallest infinite set, vacuously. Beth one is the smallest infinite set greater than or equal to two to the Beth zero. So that's two to the N, and then similarly two to the two to the N. And it's not guaranteed that Beth omega exists for the usual reasons, but if it does exist, then it's the supreme of all these things, or equivalently, in fact, it's the co-product of all these things. So it may or may not exist. Um, but there's another way of saying all Beths exist that, that again, doesn't mention order in, in any way. It's not recursive. And it's just like the thing I just said to you for Alephs, except that now, if you give me a set I, then I should be able to give you a family of sets indexed by I, where the fibers or the, the members of the family are not only non-isomorphic, but that um, you know, they're kind of they're well apart. Any two fibers, either the power set of this is less than or equal to that, or vice versa, which is a stronger statement than, than being non-isomorphic. So that's a version of, of all bets exist. Okay, now here's something that I think is really important, and I definitely didn't realize until um, I wrote these blog posts, which is that this axiom that all bets exist is, is very, very powerful. So ETCS on its own, it's thought that ETCS on its own, for example, is enough to prove um, Fermat's last theorem. Okay, so it's, it's, it's not some um, you know, feeble little thing that category theorists like it can do um, most things, um, to put it mildly, in modern mathematics. But if you add all best exist, it's even more powerful. And um, for instance, it implies that you can iterate the power set construction as many times as you like. So X is any set here, W is any well-ordered set. And in particular, it proves the Borel de determinacy theorem. So um, it doesn't matter what the Borel determinacy theorem is, except that if you ask people, where is a part of mathematics that the that ZFC's axiom of replacement is used, then someone usually says the Borel determinacy theorem. Replacement is far, far more than you need for the Borel determinacy theorem. All you need is all bets exist. Okay. Um, so I hinted that I might skip something, and I think I will skip Beth fixed points reluctantly because I like them. Um, but uh, there, so I'm skipping Beth fixed points, and I was never going to say anything about LF fixed points. But we've already talked about. Um, these four things down here. And now I'm going to talk about the stuff up here. Um, maybe I'll pause to see if there are questions. Um, so is uh, replacement um, more than having all these bets? Yeah. Yeah, so, so replacement implies that um, there are unboundedly many Oh, it certainly implies that all bets exist, yeah. Is it more, though? Is it strictly more? Yes, because all bets exist doesn't imply that there are any better fixed points, but replacement does imply that there are lots of better fixed points. Right, so yes. Is replacement more than having better fixed points? Yes, there are other things in between. Right, okay. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, because replacement, I mean, I'll come to replacement later, but because it's an axiom scheme, because it's, you know, um, rather than just an axiom, um, you can see that kind of thing um, quite easily. Um, okay, I'll move on then. Um, so I'll talk a bit about inaccessible sets, which, you know, they often come up in categorical contexts because of um, a certain relationship with Groton Deep universes. Okay, so a prior definition is that uh, an infinite set is said to be regular if uh, a disjoint union of fewer than x sets, each of which is smaller than x, is itself smaller than x. So, for example, the natural numbers is regular because, and that's saying the finite union of finite sets is finite. Okay, and an inaccessible set is one that has um, kind of lots of, um, well, inaccessibility properties. You can't get at it from beneath by counting. You can't get at it beneath from beneath by taking, um, by taking unions, and you can't get at it from beneath from the ETCS uh, um, constructions. So in other words, it's a strong limit. Um, and so the inaccessible sets, um, well, this stuff's about better fixed points, which I haven't mentioned, but it's 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 just saying that um, the inaccessibles are really are above the stuff that they're shown to be above here. That it's um, it's something more than everything that um, I mentioned before. All right, so I want to spend some time out now on measurable sets because I think um, it's a very appealing class of large sets, and uh, and it's it's categorically appealing to. And there are various slightly different ways of saying the definition. I'll say it like this. If you have a set X, you can look for probability measures that are defined on every subset of X, so defined on the whole sigma algebra of subsets of X, and moreover, only take the value zero and one. Okay, so another way of saying this is, um, is, is in terms of ultra filters, but I'll, I'll put this in terms of measures. Um, and so there are, there's a really trivial way of doing this, which is that you just choose an element of X and you declare a subset to have probability one if X is in it and zero otherwise. And so, um, uh, so those are the trivial ones. Um, but you can look for non-trivial ones and you can also strengthen the um, additivity requirement. So, you know, a probability measure is required to do a certain thing to um, countable families. So the probability of a countable disjoint union is the sum of the probabilities. But you can ask for um, that to hold not just for countable families, but um, y-indexed families for some larger set y. Now, I've said for all y smaller than x, because if you ask it to be x-fold additive or bigger than x-fold additive, that automatically makes the measure trivial. So as soon as you, so that's just asking too much. But you can sensibly ask whether there are any um, probability measures that are additive in this sense. And a set is said to be measurable if, um, an uncountable set is said to be measurable if it admits a non-trivial probability measure valued in zero one that is as additive as it can possibly be. Um, and, um, and there are lots of things to say about this definition. It's a very interesting class. I, I haven't got time to say very much. Um, what I do want to say is that um, it's a really, really strong condition. So measurability implies inaccessibility, but it's a much stronger condition. So if you take any measurable set, then um, there are unboundedly many, so x many inaccessible sets less than x. Um, so unboundedly means given, if you're given any set smaller than x, you can find some inaccessible set between it and x. And, um, and so this, you know, if there are any, any, any inaccessible sets, then the smallest one is definitely not measurable. And this is really, I mean, it's, it's significantly harder than 
all previous theorems. Um, it took about 30 years for this to be proved, I think. Um, and it follows from this that um, uh, it's consistent with ETCS and the existence of unboundedly many inaccessibles that there are no measurable sets. So it may well be that, um, that there are no measurable sets, even if there are unboundedly many inaccessibles. Um, but here's something maybe surprising, that there's a very, very um, neat categorical statement of the existence of measurable sets. So there are no measurable sets in a particular model, if and only if the countable sets are co-dense. So um, co-dense informally means that every set is a limit of countable sets in a canonical way. So that statement is true. That every set is canonically a limit of countable sets, if and only if there are no measurable sets. So the measurable sets get in the way of that being true. Um, you can talk about the co-density monad of countable sets within the category of all sets. And that's trivial if and only if there are no measurable sets. The more measurable sets there are, the more uh, interesting and more non-trivial that monad is. OK. Um, so I've now talked about the bottom four things here. I was skipping this fixed point stuff. I've talked about the top two things here. And I will just um, quickly say something about replacement. So there's a kind of myth, I think, about replacement that even people who are quite sympathetic to categorical set theory still, I think, sometimes believe that replacement uh, is something that belongs to ZFC. And that if we add replacement to ETCS, then we're kind of, I don't know, admitting defeat or something like that. Um, but that's actually really not true. So, I mean, historically, um, Cantor came up with um, a version of replacements, you know, decades before Zermelo and Frankel came up with their axioms. Um, I want to talk about a categorical version of replacement that is due to Colin McClarty. I, I'm afraid I forgot to put the reference in the slides. Um, and it goes like this, and it, it's entirely natural. So what it says in slightly informal terms is this, that if we have a set I and we have a first order formula in the language of ETCS that specifies a set F of I for each I up to isomorphism, if we have that stuff, then those sets form a family in the sense I've explained before. In other words, there is a function into I whose fibers are these sets f of i. Okay, so this is an axiom scheme, meaning there's one axiom for each of these formulas. And you can see it's quite different from um, any of the conditions we've seen before. It's quite different from saying all LFs exist or there, are, there exist inaccessible sets or anything like this. Um, it's much more sweeping in general. And it's extremely powerful, so it's equivalent to a certain form of the principle of transfinite recursion. It implies all the stuff about the existence of Beths and Beth fixed points and so on. Um, it doesn't do everything. So it doesn't imply the existence of inaccessible sets and therefore not of measurable sets either. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a reasonably intuitive um, thing. And also when you add replacement to ETCS, this is um, equivalent in the strongest possible sense to ZFC. So by interpretability, which means you can, you can translate any theorem in, of ZFC into a theorem of, of ETCS plus replacement and vice versa in a good back and forth way. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so, so, um, so that's how replacement works. And, and this is, um, I guess what I want to emphasize is this, this is, this is not a borrowing from, from ZFC. It's, it's a version of Cantor's original um, principle. And that's a point that McClarty makes um, very clearly in his, in his paper. OK, so um, let me wrap up. The, my stated purpose at the beginning was to, um, was to look at this hypothesis that 
everything in ZFC and variants of ZFC um, that is not purely internal to set theory that has some relevance to other parts of mathematics can be done smoothly in categorical set theory. So we'll never know that that's, that's true because there's a near infinite amount of, um, of membership-based theory, set theory out there. Um, but we can investigate some things. And, and, and here we had a look at the, the very beginnings of the theory of, of large cardinals, large sets um, in ETCS. Uh, okay, so, so I, I don't know of any evidence against this hypothesis, but if you know some, I'd be pleased to hear it. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, John, for the for the lovely talk. Um, are there are there any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, please, Bob, uh, go ahead. So, what what do you mean by done smoothly? <laughs> yeah, I mean this is full of subjective terms like relevant and smooth. I guess I mean that because of um, this theorem here. Um, that's kind of a guarantee that um, it can be done. Um, but, and smoothly is subjective, but, but I don't know, we all have our aesthetics and that's all I mean. Okay, good. Um, that if, if you had something that, that works really nicely in, in ZFC and as far as we know, it's a horror in ETCS, then that would be evidence against this hypothesis. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Bob. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I just want to comment that this has been very interesting. Like I, I always tr try to to see what what in, in in set theory can be replicated in category theory. And this seems like to be like an answer that I really like, like there's a way like, and as you say, there, there could be like the way you re, you translate things from set theory to category theory could be, could, could appear natural in some sense. And like that's also may help. Like I, I, I. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah thank you very much, Luis. Uh, yeah. Are there any other questions, comments? Yeah. Can I say something? Um, yes. I, I'm afraid I, I, I seem to have disabled my camera, and I haven't worked out where the setting is that does that. It's um, okay. I can imagine you, Paul. Sorry? <laughs> I can imagine you. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, now, uh, okay, so, so in case anybody else doesn't, uh, doesn't know this, Tom and I are good mates, and we probably agree about things. Um, so I'm going to say I disagree with... Um, I, I disagree with a number of things. Um, uh, but I'm wondering where 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 I could reinterpret my my disagreement. So I I feel that you're following the the um, the script of set theory a bit too closely, and uh, I, I I'd like category theory to be independent to be capable of doing foundations of mathematics and mathematics for itself without being answerable to set theory. Um, on the other hand, maybe one could interpret what you're doing as being an attempt to translate the um, hieroglyphics of set theory into into proper mathematics. How how do you feel about that? Um, I mean, I uh, so some of what I've been doing has been. Certainly, it feels like translation. Um, and um, for example, the theorem that um, the smallest inaccessible set is not measurable. What I did was to go to a, 
a book that's entirely written with this kind of with these von Neumann definitions um, of ordinal and cardinal and, and, and I found it quite um, challenging to translate it that into something isomorphism invariant um, but um, but I feel like you know there's 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 interesting mathematics here I, I, I know something of how you feel about set theory um, but um, you know I um, yeah there's I, th I think there's some translation yeah um, so uh, another thing I, I, I don't know whether I, so I think this discussion can with me can go on indefinitely if other people have got things to say then they should say them first no okay um, so e ECCS um, so we start off with these 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 things that are going to be the objects and the morphism for the category, which is yeah. copying copying what the set theorists do in the um, supposedly first order account of set theory. Um, but, yeah. so, so, so where does this, so that this has, in order to do this, we have to have pre-existing a collection in order to serve us either our sets in set theory or our morphisms in, in category theory. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that's an issue. I, and maybe that's why you said that, you know, ZFC is supposedly first order, because I think it's, it's no worse an issue here than for ZFC, is it? What, what I'm suggesting is that we can do better than that. Um, right. So um, you and I, are, you know, we are, we are finite being, beings. Um, we are only ever going to consider in our, in our lives finitely many objects and morphisms. Um, now we have to interpret that in uh, uh, carefully, but um, so uh, what? So what? What I'm saying is that where we do mathematics, we write some symbols on the page, and we yeah. and there are certain rules about if we've written down some symbols, what symbols we can write after that. And so in it's essentially what Turing set out. Um, and the, the natural way to present that is in a type theoretic way, whereas what Lorbeer did was category theory, was following the axiom of category theory. Um, yeah. And that's, that's, that's naturally corresponds to what we do in mathematics, a type theoretic presentation. Um, and the, the translation from type theory to category theory is actually very straightforward. Um, because the type theory defines a sketch, and the the category is defined from a sketch in a in a very straightforward, uniform fashion. So what I'm thinking is that is that an alternative to Lorbeer's UCCS um, would be would be writing down axioms of a of a many sorted higher order logic, whatever kind of type. Of um, followed by my construction of the of the category from the from the type from the sketch given by the type theory. Um, now I have a feeling that there's probably an equivalence between those those approaches. Yeah, I I I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know like I have your your book on the shelf just out of out of view, but um, um but and I know I think you were the first person I ever heard saying that that um that that we should be um you know, basing things on type theory, not set theory. And then it became much more commonplace to, to say it, but I'm just, yeah, I just not, I don't know enough to have a, an informed point of view on that. So I'm not gonna no. attempt to answer. Um, I see that Paul, other Paul has his hand up. Hello. Hi, Tom. Uh, yeah, Hi. by the way, I was, I was watching on YouTube. I'm not just doing it with um, um, So can you go back to your replacement slide, please? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so can I just check here? The thing that's curious to me is that you say uniquely up to isomorphism, yep. and you don't require this to be uniquely up to unique isomorphism. This is merely uniquely up to isomorphism. Is that correct? Right. So what, what I find um, surprising about this is, is that in ZF, without choice, this um, 
the thing that you're calling replacement or the Mercati called replacement is not provable, right? I mean, this implies things well. It's, it's, it, you can find an instance which is not provable in ZF. Um, now, I know you are including choice, so maybe you don't care about kind of generalizing the story or, or, or modularizing the story because choice is just there and so you might as well use it as much as possible but isn't is do you not think it could be um seen as curious to have something which you're thinking of as replacement and yet is not provable in zf i mean so first of all no um i don't think zf should be the arbiter of what counts as replacement i mean just you know again in historical terms replacement preceded zf by a couple of decades anyway um, but um, there is a, a kind of more mathematical answer. So um, Mike Shul when I was writing this blog series, Mike Shulman got very into it and did, did, he did something wonderful, which he, he added things to the series, which is he had one called, I think, 9.5 and one point called 12.5. And 12.5, I think, exactly answers your question. So I think, if I understand correctly, he had the same thought as you. And so... so uh, Number 12.5 of this series by Mike, um, uh, I believe, um, is an answer. Okay, but, but I mean, as I would say, ZF is historically came later. Okay, but you don't, you don't look at this and feel this looks choicey. I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's another way of putting it. Because to me, you know, I look at this and I'm thinking, hmm, that seems a bit choicey. You're choosing you know, the, among these isomorphism classes and then they're not unique. So there's many different isomorphisms, the way you're lining them up. It feels like it's not just that, it's not just this technical fact that it's not provable in ZF, but that kind of, for me, uh, personally corresponds to an intuition that this is a kind of choicey statement, um, but you don't feel that way about this. Not really in the, so, so first of all, um, a formula in ETCS can only ever specify anything up to isomorphism. There's no way of, of choosing, of distinguishing non-isomorphic sets because everything's mm -hmm. isomorphic, isomorphism invariant. So uniquely up to isomorphism is the best you're gonna do. It can't be uniquely up to unique isomorphism because you know, sets have many automorphisms, um, endomorphisms. Um, um, so, um, uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I just kind of think up to isomorphism is part of life when you're being isomorphism invariant. That's 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 how I personally feel for what it's worth. Okay, thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Can I come in on replacement again? Um, sure, uh, yeah. so uh, so, uh, following on from your Aleps and deaths, those are particular functors. Um, so, what I have in mind as a as an approximation to replacement is being able to um, it transform iterate any functor, any definable functor. Um, yeah. I have an idea of of how that compares with uh, full replacement. Um, well, so. I mean, there, there is a sense in which um, replacement's equivalent to transfinite recursion. I, I, mean, I know, again, this is something you've thought about a lot. Um, uh, well, no, actually, that statement that you're pointing to is, uh, is new to me. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, yeah, I mean, th there's an accurate so statement in, in one of those blogs. Is in one of those blog posts. That. Sorry? Uh, in what sense um, is this, this when it says equivalent transfinite recursion, what kind of recursion? Um, if I try and say it now, I'll get it wrong, but it's in, um, it's in I think, number 12 of that blog post series. Okay. Yeah, so the blog post is in the chat. Um, someone ah, posted it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments? Can I make a plug for, for my, my paper, which I've just submitted to a journal? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, about, um, so, so I, I claim that the, uh, the name, the categorical set theory for taking ideas of set theory and trying to turn them into ordinary mathematics and particular category theory. So there's a paper called called well-founded co-algebras and recursion, 
which you'll find at my my website on paultaylor.eu slash ordinals. I'll write that on the chat. That's, that's picking up the work that I did in the 1990s. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, well, are there any maybe final questions or comments for Tom? Well, if not, let's uh, thank him again uh, for the for the great talk. Very thank interesting you. discussion.